We're back. We're live. We're at Research in Manoa, the one o'clock rock on Monday. Margot Edwards is the director of HIGP. That's the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. Uh, and Darren Okamoto uh, is associate director yes. of the Sea Grant College at UH Manoa. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Thank you. We have important things to discuss. Let's just launch right into it, OK? <clears throat> Research at Manoa, and that's the title of our show, is threatened. Research is threatened. We had a, uh, what do you call it, um, speaker's corner piece by Peter McGinnis Mark of HIGP right. uh, just over the weekend, and we're publishing that. But I'd like to go into it in greater detail. And the proposition of his, uh, his remarks um, is that we have, we have a bill wending its way through the legislature that would undermine, seriously undermine, jeopardize the very existence of research at UH Manoa. Can you talk about it? Right, so there's actually two bills. There's 1625 and 1700. Yes, yes. And 1625 is, is mostly been turned into a bill that sort of reports on how well we do at the university in terms of the research enterprise. But 1700 is a big concern because it's basically taking $45 million and very quickly moving it away from researchers and into, into mostly maintenance for UH facilities, which is something that's definitely a need, but taking that $45 million away from UH research I think is going to have an astounding uh, economic impact on both the university and the state. Sure is. Yeah. You know what? It sounds punitive to me. Uh, it's, it's punishing the university in some way. I, I, I don't know that I can ascribe any motives to anybody for why they ever want to do things, but there, there's clearly a, a role in th that the university, I think, can play better, which is to sort of document what it is that we do at research at the UH and why it's so important, especially Manoa campus is where most of our research takes place. And, you know, Manoa campus brings in $300 million a year in extramural funds and research. Industry. It is, and that's for about a $50 million investment from the state. So, you know, the, the idea that we're not contributing back based on what we're getting is, is incorrect. And we need to do a better job of getting out to the community and, and spreading that message. And that's why we're here. That's why we're here, Research in Manoa. It's not like we don't care about research. We care about research. We want it to happen. We want Hawaii to be a center of research in every way possible. I mean, we are isolated by, what, 2,600 miles or more. We're the most isolated island chain, populated island chain in the world. And uh, we have got to distinguish ourselves. This is one way we can do that. And we have done it. We've got some incredible research. Can you give us the depth and breadth of the research effort as it exists now at UH? Oh, boy, that would probably take uh, longer than okay, your show has. we don't have time has. for that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean. Ma make, make a box. Well, I mean, think everything from space, right? We have, we have programs that are working on deep space all the way down to the bottom of the ocean, which is where I like to study, in terms of just the sort of physical earth processes. But there's also a lot going on in terms of the animals, in terms of human beings, in terms of research about, you know, historic events that happened a long time ago. I mean, research kind of bleeds through every aspect of what it is that we do at the university. It's, it's a really important part of what we do. Jay, if I can just add something else, this is like a trivial fact, but um, you know, the U University of Hawaii at Manoa is actually only one of three universities in the nation that has both a, a sea grant, space grant, land grant, and uh, sun grant program. So the other two programs would be Oregon State and Cornell. Mm. So we're only one of three that actually support all four types of research efforts. And this is our special sauce because we're here in this very special environment. How does the special environment help us do the research? How does it motivate us? How does it offer more data? You know, how does that work that makes us special out here, isolated? Well, you said, you said isolated a couple of times, and that's really important for the biologists, right? Evolutionary biology, I can't imagine a better place on the planet to study that than in the Hawaiian Islands that have been 2,500 miles removed from everywhere. But also, if you look at a map of the US, with the exception of Alaska, and Alaska can't really do it over the same, the same small area that we can, 
we go from 12,000 feet up to 12,000 feet down, <laughs> and we have the ability to study everything that's in between there. No other state can do that, and that really makes us unique. Plus, you know, I think one of the things that makes Hawaii really special is we've had this cultural collision of all these different cultures that have come in and, and, and tried to do things their own way. We've learned from each other. Sometimes we've learned in painful ways, but sometimes we've learned in very positive ways. And that's really unique compared to the, especially the contiguous 48. So I, what I get the feeling is, is that Hawaii, because of that, its special characteristics, um, has, has got a handle on the earth, uh, and that's SOEST uh, and HIGP. I mean, it's got, a, and, and a C grant, it's got a handle on the earth. It, it can do more in finding out about the earth than most other places. But query, why is that important? Why do we need, why do we humanity need, and why do we Hawaii need to know about the earth? I don't want to answer all the questions, but the obvious multiple one. multiple compound questions. <clears throat> it's my specialty. The, the, <laughs> the obvious one to me is we know that there are things changing on the planet. I mean, you don't, even if you're a skeptic about what's happening with climate change, you can see what's happening to the homes on the North Shore as they're getting eroded by these big wave events that are coming, right? We can see what's happening to the, the acidification of our oceans and the dying of the corals. These are effects that are going to, uh, you know, change what you're doing, I'm doing, if you're a fisherman, if you're, if you're somebody who just enjoys recreation in the ocean, you know, you need to know about these changes so that you can adapt to them in your own life, you know, so it's what, what we're trying to study, the basic science questions that we're trying to answer really have an impact on, on people who just work at sort of nine to five jobs that aren't in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, and all over the world. I mean, this, this information, these conclusions that you reach, uh, research papers that you write and, and disseminate, they, are, they affect, they are of interest everywhere in the world because right now it's a, it's a global problem. And, and on the medical side, you know, you talked about the collision of, uh, of races and um, DNA. <laughs> right. Um, this is a great place to do medical research and we should encourage that in every way because we, we have the resources, we have the people uh, we can do that. We can we can see how it works with this segment of the population and that segment of the population. Um, so the medical school is a it's a it's a cornucopia and the cancer center and there's AIDS research going on. I mean, I attended the AIDS research. Was it AIDS zero? AIDS to zero? HIV to zero program uh, two three months ago. Uh, there's really interesting research going on medically. Mm -hmm. Recently, that will be that will be disruptive research. That will you know what did Cecilia Shakuma say? We're not looking to, uh, you know, give you a, a symptomatic relief. We're looking to stamp out the virus. Let's get it straight. Mm -hmm. Now that's disruptive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Gee, if I can go to go back to the previous question, really, um, you know, our program, Sea Grant College program, is is really an important, um, I would say, organization, say within the university and within SOAS itself, because what we do is we support university-based research. We um, support outreach into the community, and we support education activities, both formal and informal education activities. And so really, what we do is we have a, a core group of extension faculty that serve as this sort of conduit for, for two-way information transfer. So taking the research that's generated at the university and then translating and disseminating that information to the community to address what the priority needs are. And then also, because they live and work in the community, is taking what those needs and priorities are bringing that information back to the researchers at the university and help them shape that research. So, so, so disseminating this information is also an important component. It's a, a two-way street. You bet. So I know you've been asked this question a thousand million times, but can you describe what a Sea Grant College is? Sure, I'm happy to describe that. So the, the Sea Grant College, actually, um, we are one of 33 programs nationwide. We form this national network. And we are a state or university-based partnership with the federal government. Our federal partner is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And so every year we get funding from NOAA basically to run our programs. And we have actually those three main um, activities that I told you about, research, outreach, and, and education. And by congressional law, um, you know, for every two federal dollars that we receive, we're supposed to be required to provide that with one non-federal dollar match. 
And so, you know, if this bill is actually passed where, you know, we're, we eliminate the re that research funding, the federal funding, then our program would cease to exist. That's, I want to get to that. I want to get to that. It's, this is not just a drill. This is not just a question of degree. It has huge implications. And some research, maybe a lot of research, will simply cease to exist. How does it work? How does that work? Can you describe that in detail? Well, so one of the things that I think has been miscommunicated, and you know, I've been on the receiving end of, of having things edited in weird ways on television shows. So, but one of the things that's been miscommunicated is you, you can't use federal dollars to say fund our basketball team. As proud as I am of what the basketball guys have done, you know, you can't say I'm NASA. I'm going to build you a space probe for a million dollars, and by the way, you're going to give me a hundred thousand dollars so that we can send these guys over to a basketball game. There's probably a good reason for that. You're not allowed to do that. So if we have if we have a mandate in the case of Sea Grant that says federal matching has to be at this such and such a level. We're required to do that. We can't just take all the money that we get from the National Science Foundation and, and put it to what we think is the important problem. We've written a proposal, and we have to stick to what it is that we said that we were yeah, going to do. Every grant has parameters, and you have to stay within the parameters. Huh? That's correct. OK, so you write for a grant. You get federal money for a grant, and you, hundreds of millions of dollars of grants come in. And that's, that's because the, the researchers who write the grants have important issues to discuss, to research, and because the federal government likes to see that happen, it's not, it's not just a, a, a money pipeline, it's for a good reason. <clears throat> okay, so you write the grant, you get the grant back, you get the money with strings attached, mm -hmm. but now there's a problem. Now, the state funds that are going to be taken away under this bill, $45 million, they, wh where do they customarily go to? Well, so a lot of what we call RTRF, the Returned Overhead Funds, so we actually have like a little 40%, uh, I'm going to call it a surcharge, that's on top of my million dollar grant. So 41% on top of that is used to pay for things like university secretarial support and overhead and lights and telephones, right? And every three years what happens is these funding agencies come and we lay open our books. We say, this is what we paid for our, our mortgage. This is what we paid for our lights, just like with your house, right? And based on that, the, the federal government decides what that return of overhead funds can be. And within that number, there can be a little bit for, you know, beefing up equipment or facilities infrastructure. But you don't get to take that whole pile of money and just put it at making infrastructure new again. You have to still pay those, those other salaries and the Operational like. expenses. That's right. You have to pay them. And, and, you, and you pay those operational expenses out of this state state money. The returned overhead. The funds. returned overhead. That's right. Um, and, that, and that is uh, largely what for uh, uh, post-grad students, research assistants, wh where does it go? No, a lot of times what I'll do is in my own grant, I'll have the money for the postgraduate students, the postdoctoral students, or for the research assistants. But for example, in HIGP, we have a staff that has probably four secretaries and four fiscal administrators that help everybody get those proposals together. And a little bit of that funding will be used to keep those folks funded. So in, in Darren's point, if, if HIGP were to go away, it's not only the researchers that go away, it's that staff that they've been supporting, the technical staff that they've been supporting. It actually filters down, in our case, for about 100 researchers in HIGP, we'd probably lose two to three times that many jobs. Ooh. And what happens then? Suppose this, I mean, give me the domino effect here. Well, I mean, I think that the domino effect is then I'm not paying my mortgage. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to the grocery store. I'm, and so everybody around me is going to be affected. I've seen, you know, it depends on how you parse the numbers, but I've seen that for every dollar that I earn, probably about half of it goes back into the state. So you, you take, uh, unrelated to UH now, right? You take away my dollar and my job and half of that would have been going back into the state. Yeah, and I leave town. Right. I go. Yeah. I mean, this just happened uh, when uh, through 21, remember that? The, the tech tax credit, when, you know, was, was sunset early, demolished <laughs> in the legislature. Um, a lot of researchers left town. 
uh, developers, tech developers, they left town. That was the end of that. Because if there was no money coming in in the pipeline, in the 221 pipeline, there was nothing to pay them with. And they were gone. Yeah, the Finished. other thing we didn't talk about, Jay, is, is you know, research also supports workforce development. Yeah. And it supports both graduate and undergraduate education opportunities. And in Sea Grant, you know, every, every year we support, on average, about 15 graduate students. Yeah. And really it's about developing their capacity as researchers, but we also, you know, train them up to be good stewards of the community. So they do 40 hours of outreach a, a week. I mean, a year, sorry, and they, they give a presentation at Hanama Bay to the community to share, disseminate their research information. So, so we're really cutting off also the supply of, um, you know, the next generation of faculty members, the next generation of, say, state agency managers, and even undergraduates who do research as well. It, it's we're your outreach cutting that being off. impaired. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's take a, a short break. When we come back, um, I think I'd like to show you the film, the video of Speaker's Corner. Uh, that Peter McGinnis Mark made over the weekend. If we can take a look at that when we come back. We'll be sure. right back. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Come join us every Friday at 2 p.m. when I interview interesting scientists about what they do, why they do it, and why we should all care about it. It's a lot of fun to see. We hear, and you can learn interesting stuff. You'll hear all kinds of fascinating science, and we know you'll have a great time. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Aloha, my name is Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm the host of Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. We air live on the internet and also on Oceanic Channel 16. I would invite you to come for a fresh new show every Tuesday from 12 to 1 o'clock. I try to bring on guests that give us a different viewpoint on aspects of sustainability in Hawaii as well as trying to unpack some of the difficult concepts of measuring and achieving sustainability, particularly with regard to sustainable economic growth and prosperity in Hawaii. Please join us every Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m. Mahalo, aloha. Okay, we're back, we're live. We're here with Margot Edwards and Darren Okimoto talking about research in Manoa, talking about how research is being threatened these days. And the uh, Peter McGinnis Mark movie is not available right now, but it is on YouTube. And if you go to youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii, you will see it. It was loaded up, it was uploaded just this weekend. And it's very interesting on the same topic. Yeah, what well, we haven't talked about, a lot of things we haven't talked about, I mean, this, is, this deserves more time, is the students, the effect on the students. How does pulling research funds affect the students? Right, so I think Darren's point was a really good one that, you know, we, we try and get students engaged in research. And to my mind, research is sort of an apprenticeship for students. It's, it is teaching, it's just a different kind of teaching. It's not students sitting in a lecture hall, which is an important component of being taught, but they can sit in a lecture hall and learn about oceanography, and I can take them out on a ship to the middle of the ocean and I can show them what the ocean really looks like. I can measure it with them. I can show them all the instrumentation for what it is that we do. And hopefully I can inspire a bunch of them to want to become oceanographers. Right? I can't do that a hundred at a time. That's not the way research works. And I think if there's any place where university instructors and university researchers can come together, it would be trying to make those unique sort of hands-on opportunities more available to more students. But every student that you'll talk to within SOEST or, or a research department is going to tell you about some adventure that they've had when they've been out in the field or they've been out you know, at sea and they've, they've learned something because of it just happening to them right there that they just it connected what they learned in the book with a, a brain cell so that suddenly, ah, okay, the light bulb moment happens and they're really excited about this field. Research is critically important for motivating our students. Yeah, this reminds me of the uh, program back a few months ago with Seymour, the uh, Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education with Dave Carl. And I realized, um, you know, that they got a big award at that time from National um, Biology Association. And um, I realized that a lot of their researchers come from overseas, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them are local too. But they come and they go on station Aloha out there, which is the same way as you know your boats and ships work. And um, you know they they spend a month at, at a time out there, or whatever how long, and they work together day in and day out. 
and to carry that research not only as lessons for their own education, but to carry it back to other places where they, because if you want to be a researcher, you have to research first. You can't say, I'm going to be a researcher and start researching then. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have to be a postgraduate, postdoc researcher, right? You, you have to research to research. Not necessarily. I mean, right now I'm working with three undergraduate students. One's from Kaneohe, one's from Maui, and one's an army brat, so he's lived everywhere. And, you know, we're trying to work on illegal fishing, and we're literally sort of just stepping them through what are the questions that you ask, looking at this data set. You know, let's go meet the Coast Guard and find out from the Coast Guard what their questions are. And, you know, by sort of pulling them down this path as young 20-somethings, you know, I'm hoping that I'm getting them very excited about a problem, you know, fisheries maintenance is going to be critical, important, critically important to most of us who want to eat fish in the future. Yeah. Well, this, this teaches me a couple of things, what you said. I mean, first is that um, knowledge doesn't grow on trees. You, you have to go look at it. You have to embrace it. You have to immerse yourself into it. And you're not going to be a researcher unless you've done that. We, you know, we, in this program, Research in Manoa, they come every week, you know, and one common denominator is that everybody here is dedicated for life to this area of research. Um, and, and it's really remarkable how they got into it and how they decided they were gonna stay in it and how they do it all day long. It's not like a regular you know, job. It's not like a regular career. It's an investment of your whole, as, as Robbie Yaam um, always says, it's all in, mm -hmm. all in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so Jay, if I can actually go back and add to what Margot Mar 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 had said about um, stu giving students the experience with research. So, you know, in our Sea Grant Network, we have a, um, an annual fellowship called the John A. Canals uh, Marine Policy Fellowship, which is at the national Sea Grant level. Each program is, is allowed to send up six applications um, into this pool. And of that pool of approximately a little over 100 applications, about 45 get selected to serve either in the executive branch or the legislative branch of Congress. And this is such a wonderful opportunity for them to get really a hands-on experience, you know, working with our federal agencies, um, mainly NOAA, and also with, within our congressional, you know, representatives and senators, and really learn how, how marine policy and works and how it's implemented. And, and um, over the years, you know, these um, students have gone in to be placed in, you know, upper levels of administration. And, and so it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And the other thing, though, is that without that research background, you know, they wouldn't have had that understanding to really be effective, you know, in these, you know, fellowship. Yeah, yeah. And research includes knowing the legal framework, the regulatory framework for all the activities. Okay. You can't you can't do the research uh, about the earth in, until you also understand the way it's governed. And this is part of what they learn that way. And research also includes engineering. So I think you've had Luke Flynn on your show talking about the Hawaii Space Flight Lab. I mean, Luke has dozens and dozens of kids, lots of whom are at our community colleges here in Hawaii, who are learning how to build CubeSats, right? Talk about a skill that's going to be useful for the future, you know? I, I think that what Luke has done is just a tremendous program. And it's not just about the basic science questions. It's about engineering, too. Yeah. Yeah, God, this reminds me of uh, you and Iolani, Margo. Mm. They love you there. I love those kids. <laughs> we have you, these you smart kids. Them, you, you mentor them, you make them alive. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that's the other point, and I think that that can sometimes get lost when you think about the university and the importance of an education for the university. That's absolutely true, but you have to ask yourself the what then question, Jay, right? What happens after the four-year degree if we continue to ship all these smart kids to Mountain View, California, and Boston, Massachusetts, and you know, name all the places where the high-tech industry are starting up? Research is what's most likely to get us the high-tech industries here in Hawaii so that our Hawaiian kids can stay here and work on problems that are important to us. Yeah, and, you, and you've gone a long way in that direction. I mean, does Woods Hole have anything on us? Well, <laughs> I suppose we can talk about that. Colder weather. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that UH, uh, SOWEST and its component parts, um, is world known in many areas. And we are a formidable player. And it's, it's all about research. It's, and so if you diminish the research or, and this is really salient, if you show you don't care about it, mm -hmm. if you show that it's not a priority for you on a governmental or regulatory level, you're making a statement, you know, that's huge to the world. 
to the, all the guys who might go to Woods Hole, uh, all, the, all the researchers who might come here, invest their lives here, uh, and, and to the reading public, you know, who reads their papers and all that. We lose prestige. You're 100% right. 120% yeah, right. Yeah. We have to look like we live in a, in a society that supports this activity. And when you see a bill wending its way through the legislature that is obviously not in support of this activity, you really, I mean, me or anyone out there, me or anyone who understands what's going on here, um, you are sad because this is so negative. Yeah. How did we get here? I mean, what happened? Um, I, I don't think we can explain why the maintenance is such a problem at UH. That's probably a, a discussion that would take forever. Mm. Um, but how do we get to a point where the legislature and maybe the community also doesn't understand how important research is, not only to the university, not only to the state, but to the world. How come we don't understand that? Let's talk about education. Maybe specific individuals are educated about how to do research or the products of the research, but the community also needs to be educated about the importance of research as a sort of generic animal. Um, what, do we, what do we do about that? Well, that's a, I think that's a great question. And, you know, one of the things that sort of happens is, for example, if you've been to the Soest Open House, the Soest Open House is wonderful. There are thousands of kids that come with their parents and they learn all about earth science. And, you know, we do it every other year, but after a while you sort of start to lose interest in that because you've done it, right? I mean, so far we haven't. I'm, I'm exaggerating. So far the Soest Open House just keeps growing and growing and growing. But Same it, thing with IFA, by the way, Institute for Astronomy. It's grown and grown and grown. Everybody, you know, so peop there is an interest, but... But it, sometimes if you super saturate the market with, we're really good, we're doing this, we're really good, we're doing this, people just tune it out, right? And I've heard it before. I, right. And so I don't know the answer to your question, but I have a concern that we need to be able to to make the case clearly and as frequently as possible so that people don't turn off that radio dial and say, you know, I've already heard that, I don't need to know it anymore. Because I really do think that's what gets us to the situation where, you know, we haven't been beating our own chests and, and saying we're really great at what we do. And so all of a sudden it's like, eh, let's get rid of those guys. Yeah. And, and you guys, you know, publish in the, 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 the journal Nature or whatever. <clears throat> it, does, it does not get into the newspaper. It does not get into the newspaper. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows, you know, all the fantastic things that are happening at, at Manoa and elsewhere. Uh, so I, I don't know how we fix that, but I think that's, that's got to be, uh, that's, that's our job yeah. here at Think Tech. Okay. We see it as all our right. job. All right, great. Mm -hmm. You know, we want the public to know everything that happens that's really good and, and um, you know, vital uh, for research. And we want the public to also know how research is conducted, you know, what it's like to be a researcher and how thrilling it is and how the opportunities are so great for anybody who goes through the process. Well, and I think the other thing that we can do is take a lesson from places that have done it very effectively. Like if you look at UW, you know, everybody wants to go to the University of Washington and their, their scientific program, I'm sorry, doesn't rate as highly as our scientific program does, you know. University of California at San Diego, Scripps, has a terrific program, you know. Everybody knows Stanford and nobody's embarrassed to say, you know, Stanford spun off all of these guys. So, you know, the other thing I think we can do is go interact with those guys more and take lessons from what it is that we're doing. And the UH, to be fair, is trying to do that. So I don't know if you've gone and seen the new, the new iLab oh, yet. Oh, we did a movie about it, playing right now on OC16. Right. It's playing right now. And why don't we take a minute off? You can go to OC16 and see our movie. We'll yeah. be right back. Great. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna. I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Hi, my name is Sachiko Slomov. I'm the floor manager of Think Tech Hawaii here. Uh, you can join us on the air every weekday from 1 to 5 or off the air at thinktechhawaii.com. We stream all of our videos and all of our amazing like, 
amazing shows ho, 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 at thinktechhawaii.com or on our Ustream channel. You can also check us out on Twitter at thinktechhi or Instagram at thinktechhi also. I'll be listening and I hope to see you there. Thanks. We're back. We're live. Uh, we're here with Margot Edwards and uh, Darren Okamoto, and we're talking about research in Manoa. We're talking about threats to research. Yeah, I think people should understand about iLab. I, I, that's a, for relatively little money, $100,000, took an old building, used to be the registration building. Mm -hmm. Then it was the, um, you know, the, the, the tech building. Now the tech building is a, a much bigger, better nice building. Room, yeah. um, and they converted it into an open space modular innovation lab. And anyone can come in from any school in the, in the campus and outside the campus. They have high school kids coming in there. And they have monitors, student monitors, and they have teachers. They teach courses in there. Then all the furniture is modular. You can roll it around. You get these whiteboards you can write on. And they encourage you to leave the whiteboard written on so that other people can see your work. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is to try to, you know, sort of a joint stimulation. And they have a 3D scanner, which is really an important piece of gear. Mm -hmm and a 3D printer that can print the thing. And the 3D printer is, I mean, it's, it's the latest and greatest. And they have some fantastic videography, video, uh, you know, equipment there. But mostly it's a place where you can just go and schmooze about ideas. It's, they're trying so hard to make it, you know, an open idea mill and come and, and share. And, uh, you know, it's like a, it's like an, it's like a, an idea lounge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We need a faculty lounge too, by the way. Yeah. But it's an idea lounge for anyone who has an idea. That's the great thing about iLab. And it demonstrates the interest of the university in, in putting that together and bringing all the disciplines together and having people have ideas together, whatever they are. It's great. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> it's just an example of where things are going. The university seems to be in good shape under David Lasner, actually. I'm, I'm a big fan of President Lasner. I think that it really matters that he got his degree from there. You yeah, know, I yeah. think that he's, he's definitely motivated to uh, make UH look great. Yeah, he understands about research. Yeah. He understands all the, you know, the way you calculate the grants. I don't think people understand that, you know, exactly how the, the economics of research. They don't understand, for example, how much, if you say it's 300 million or $500 million came down in grants, they don't, they don't understand how much work goes into that. Yeah. Not only on the science side, but on the administrative side. Well, and I think the other thing is, you know, we've, especially, you can, people can parse numbers in different ways, right? And if you hear, if you hear 5 million from one person and 15 million from another person, then suddenly it's like, well, you know, which one am I going to believe? So the university actually has an economic research organization that develops reports that are online. You uh, hero. Yeah, yeah, the you hero reports. And if people are interested, you know, I, I guess maybe you could say that they have a slight conflict of interest because they're university. But they go through and they actually document, you know, what every branch of the university is contributing to the state and to the system. It's there, Margot. I mean, it's there for the, for the asking. It's, it's there in so many ways that people, the community can find out what's going on. Uh, I remember, the, no kidding, this is not a joke. Back when we started doing think tech, there was one guy, he was in a defense contractor doing research, and he said, he had a bumper sticker that said, have you hugged your researcher today? <laughs> <laughs> no, no kidding. <laughs> and he really did have that. That's a good one. So I think the community has to hug researchers. You know, this is not so much a, an economic thing that, that we see here in the legislature. It's an attitudinal thing about research. Mm. It doesn't treat research as important. Mm. And that's, that's the problem. We have to make it see that research is important. How do you do that? You, you have contact with the kids. But you don't have that much contact with the legislature is the problem, yeah? Don't have as much contact with the ledge. I'm starting to work with state mm -hmm. agencies more, and I know that Darren is, in terms of trying to look at these issues like mitigating the impacts of sea level rise and, you know, I mean, something just as simple as the love of, of these quadcopters and the fact that quadcopters were flying over on the big island and mapping what was going on with the flow, you know, that's research because you're finding out how a volcano erupts, but it's also critically important to the people that are living over there, right, and want to know if their house is being approached by 
lava and if they need to do something about it. You know, so sort of this idea of dual use, all these questions that we're asking can help you know, us decide if we're gonna keep our shorelines moving out or moving in. What do we wanna do? Well, it in affects terms everyone. Of, right. The other thing that I've noticed is that research now, especially in Seoul West and uh, where you guys live, is, is big data. You, you're able to collect data as you never were. I mean, think, think, were you able to do this, say, in 1990? I don't no. think so. No. It's only in the last, what, 10 years, maybe, maybe, where you could collect huge amounts of data, and then you could make algorithms that would read that data, interpret that data, and let you come to conclusions. So the reality is that now you can embrace much more information, and you can make much more sophisticated conclusions that are more likely to be correct and useful to the community at large. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been within your careers recent. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. And um, just to mention, Jay, that you know, um, our program uh, was one of six Sea Grant College programs that, that got a grant from, um, from NOAA uh, to support NOAA coastal resilience efforts. And it's going to be approximately $845,000. That is a partnership with the state, um, let's see, the Office of Planning and uh, Sam Lemo Shop. The, um, let's see, Department of Land and Natural Resources Office of Conservation and Coastal Lands. And uh, the main idea for this grant basically is to really um, support research into climate adaptation and also with sea level rise and looking at the impacts. And then, pre um, and then having that data then actually um, viewed on, on um, the Pacific Island Ocean Observing System website. They're gonna create a website to visualize this data so people can see how they're impacted, say, by sea level rise. Uh, and that information is also going to be informing the state climate adaptation report that's being developed, you know, um, at the end of 2017. And so those are just a couple of the things that are that the research is going to support that's going to really help improve our, say, our state's resilience to these different climate impacts. It's, it's the action point that I worry about. We had an architect uh, on the show from New York a few weeks ago. She spoke at the School of Architecture. They brought her out here. And um, one of the things that I learned from her is that she realized there would have to be some infrastructure building around New York, around the Manhattan Island, to protect against uh, sea, uh, sea level rise. So she went to Bloomberg, then the mayor, and she said, here, this, this is, I'm an architect. This is my plan. This is how you will be able to protect the, the island of Manhattan. <laughs> and they bought that. You know, so she, I mean, uh, she's not an academic, she's an architect, but kind of like an academic, uh, and, and she gave them a plan. And I think what's going to happen ultimately about sea level rise here is that the uh, academic community is going to come to the mayor or the governor and say, maybe Chip Fletcher, mm -hmm. here's a plan. Mm -hmm. This is what you need to do, and this is what you need to do first, second, third, and here's the, you know, here's the engineering techniques. I guess that would come from the School of Engineering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, then, then it gets really real because otherwise, it, you know, you worry about it. It's theoretical and the government doesn't know how to form its own action plan. And so I think, that, you know, there's a realization feature here. Over time, the government will have to realize that the secret, the solution lies in you. It lies in the work you're doing and it has to listen to you. Yeah. You know, an interesting thing about that, I just happen to know a little bit about that New York plan because I, I moved here from New York 25 years ago. And uh, it was the Museum of Modern Art in New York that did an exhibit on various people's solutions for trying to, to mitigate sea level impacts on Manhattan Island. And they had so much attendance from people coming into the art museums that started then going back to their <laughs> ledge, you know? I mean, but it seems to me that that's something that Hawaii could do too. I mean, we have a pretty vibrant art community. And if we were to start taking some of these more um, architectural, which is always, in my mind, both a combination of engineering and beauty, right? And take that to the artistic side and start spreading our message that way. I mean, we don't have to just go down the sort of researchy and engineering path. We're all in this little island canoe right? We need to work together. We need to work together. And that, you know, and the problem is that legislators come and go, you know, there's a biennium and then there's another biennium, and, you know, and, the, and the result is they stay for a few years and go, and then you, you're up against a, a re-education program frequently. And the, the new guys don't know. They don't, they don't have any idea. 
and, and I mean, how do you have a lingering, I mean, a, a long-term educational program from the university to the ledge that works on these critical issues? I don't know the answer, but I think there's, there's a need for it well, somewhere along the line. I think maybe one thing we need to do, do uh, Jay, is, is something similar like a SOAS open house, but maybe for the legislature. Yeah. And, and really, you know, take the research to them, yeah. and and have our researchers be out there with our students and basically present the information and basically how it is really making our lives better, yeah. you know, affecting with the public students. safety with yeah. the students as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. I, I I can't imagine why you would take money out of research and put it into something that has been deferred and can be deferred and will be deferred probably anyway. Um, it, it all just seems um, badly motivated to me. And um, I just, what, what would you say? What would you say? There's the legislature over there. Camera two. Margaret. Camera two. What, what would you say to the legislature uh, on this issue? What should they do now? Well, I think that bills 1625 and 1700 need to go away. I don't think that they're doing anything useful for the university, for the state, or for the children of Hawaii. And I think that if any of our legislators would like to come down and see how my personal research matters, I'd be delighted to show them. I'd also be delighted to show up at the ledge and, and tell them. You know, I did go to the bill for 1625, and it's not, it's, not a, it's not a process that's conducive to saying research matters. You know, we wrote in response to 1625, there were more than 200 letters opposed to 1625, not one in favor, and the bill still passed. Oh, wow. Which is stunning wow, to stunning, me. Wow, stunning, stunning. Oh, unbelievable, actually. Yeah. Well, I hope it stops now. It should stop now. I think we're, uni we're uniform, uh, universal on that here. Uh, Darren, what would you add to Margo? You know, I, I would There's just, the legislature over there. You're going to okay, talk to them. Sure. <laughs> no, I would just say, you know, um, Please uh, come and talk to us, and, and like Margo said, you know, we'll be happy to share more information with you about what we do um, in terms of a university and the research, and really consider the impacts that it will have, not just on the university, but also, you know, for our, our you know, communities in Hawaii as well, because, you know, the students and, and all of communities will also be affected as well, and it's not just the university. Yeah. And I would add this. It's time to stop this, these bills right now because if you allow these bills to continue and you put them in the press and you show the world that there's even a possibility they might pass we are embarrassed we look bad we don't have our act together and the world will see they should be put to bed right away and this should not happen again research must be held sacrosanct at the university in our state among our people our students our population in general and in the legislature that's just my thought, my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Margo, Margo, Margo Edwards. Thank you, Darren, Darren Okimoto, for coming down and discussing this. I hope you'll come back, yeah. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, thank you so much, Jay. Aloha.